All right, kingdom culture. Here at the Roads, we get excited about the Bible because we believe it is the bread of life and we like to eat. So if you got your Bibles, come on, Mount Carmel, North City, E. Rhodes family, let's get excited as we open them up to Matthew chapter 13. Woo! Matthew 13. Woo, doggies. Sermon notes are available in your worship guide or on the YouVersion Bible app. If you have those, note takers are, thank you, world changers. If you're looking at your YouVersion uh, notes, they will be a little bit different from your paper notes that were in your worship guides because I had to have the worship guide uh, notes turned in by uh, Friday morning at 9 o'clock, and I had a few adjustments <laughs> that I had to make <laughs> between then and Sunday, so uh, those are a little, little bit different, but you just listen, you can take notes for yourself. Matthew chapter 13, there's seven parables about the kingdom of heaven. That's what we've been talking about. So today we want to see what Jesus has to speak to us about the kingdom of heaven what that means. I'm going to start, I'm going to preach on two verses today, believe it or not, just two verses, and it will only take an hour and a half. So here we go. I'm just kidding. New people are like, what? No, really. Verse 31, Matthew 13, verse 31 says, another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs, and it becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Jesus starts out this parable of the mustard seed, and he's talking here, and he says in verse 31, the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. So what is the kingdom of heaven? I said this during this series, but I want to just reiterate it. The kingdom of heaven is not a geographical location only. Usually when we think about kingdom of heaven, we think about up there. So it says the kingdom of heaven is not just a geographical loca location, but it's actually the foundational principal components of heaven. Foundational principal components of heaven. The system or culture of heaven. And we talk about culture, Webster defines culture as the set of attitudes, values, goals, and practices of a society or organization. So we put those together. The kingdom culture is a set of attitudes, values, goals, or practices of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom culture, is the attitudes, values, and goals, and practices of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. Notice what it says, the kingdoms of heaven. When it says of heaven, it's not just in heaven. But these are attitudes, values, practices, and goals that come from heaven. It's not just about heaven up there, but it's telling us where they're coming from. Because Matthew 4, 17 says this, From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So when Jesus came, he started pre preaching this sermon. And here was his first sermon. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven, from heaven, is at hand or has come close, is here approaching you, this is what's been brought near to you. So when we talk about that, we understand now that Jesus is saying the foundational principal components of heaven, the attitudes, values, practices, and goals of heaven have come to the earth. All right, you know what I'm saying? That Jesus was saying to people that, hey, the attitudes, values, practices, and goals of heaven, I brought them with me. When Jesus came to preach, he came to preach and tell us everything that I am, who I am, what my attitude about life, my, my goals, my practices, my values, all of that that you see, it's from heaven, but I've brought it to the earth. So it's not just something you can have when you get there. Jesus came to show us we can have it here. We could be it here. That's what he did. You're like, well, that's Jesus. I know but Jesus in us gives us ability to be like him. I don't realize I'm not like him on my own, but Jesus was saying, I want to teach you about the kingdom of heaven. Not just what heaven's going to be like when you get there. I want to teach you about the kingdom of heaven you can have on the earth. Wow, what a revolutionary idea. Jesus said, said we're supposed to pray this way. Uh, Matthew 6 verse 10 your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as, comparative statement, as it is in Jesus said to pray that. We say the, the Lord's prayer all the time. Do we believe what we're praying? 
that Jesus said to pray that, Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he's saying, I want you to make earth look like heaven. I don't want you to survive this horrible place so you can really get to the good place. I want you to, I'm bringing heaven to the earth, Jesus said. And I'm going to teach you the system, the principles, the components, the culture of heaven. And then I want you to infiltrate the earth so that the earth begins to look like heaven because of you. That's just what he said. But he said, here's the problem. In order for you to do that, it's going to cause you to have to change the way you think. Because he said, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does repent mean? Greek word metaneo. Repent does not mean I'm sorry. I just need to repent. Lord, I'm sorry for what I did. That's not repentance. Repentance is not telling God you're sorry. Repentance is not saying, God, forgive me. That is not repentance. Repentance literally means this. To change the way you think in order to produce a new thought pattern, a new way of behaving, a new way of operating, when you change your thoughts and your attitudes about sin and righteousness. In other words, when you change the way you think about what's wrong and when you change what you think about what's right, all of a sudden it changes your behavior, begin to act a different way, you go from walking this way to go to walking that way, that is repentance. That's what God is telling us. He said, change the way you think. So when the only way we're going to grasp the system of heaven is if we change the way we think. Why? Because we're indoctrinated with the culture of the world. From the time we're a wee little person, we get inundated with the culture of the world. So he said, if you're going to operate in the kingdom of heaven, the system, the culture, the attitudes, values, principles, and concepts of heaven, you're going to have to change the way you think. Because the culture of the world is calling evil good and good evil. Isaiah 5.20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. When, he's, when the Bible says woe, it's not talking about riding a horse. Woe. It's not talking about that. Woe is like beware. Like look out. Beware those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So in making our decisions, running our life, we need to use common sense. Right? That's good. But we need to use the sense that is common to the right kingdom. I believe 100% in common sense. As long as that sense is common to the kingdom of heaven. Because you're going to operate, if you're a believer, you're a follower of Jesus, there's going to be times that God tells you to do something that does not make sense to the common world. But it's very common to the kingdom of heaven. In other words, as Devane's testimony, we are something, our money's running short, we're, we're having financial difficulty. So God says, okay, I want you to give more. That makes no sense to the world, but it's common sense to the kingdom of God. It's common sense. You sow, you, that's common sense in the kingdom of God. Makes perfect sense. You give, you will receive. So I don't receive, I don't give so I can receive, but it's a principle that when I give, God's going to honor that. You give love to someone, you're going to receive love. So if I need more, I give more. People say, I don't make any sense. I know it doesn't to this kingdom, but it's common sense where I come from. (laughs) It's common sense in the kingdom. So that's why we want to operate with that kind of sense. So what is this kingdom like? Because remember this. It's not about when we're aligning ourselves with the kingdom. It is not about a political party. It's not about a certain belief system and Republican or Democrat. It's not about that. The very important thing is what kingdom we align ourselves with. I don't care what political party you vote for. I care what kingdom we align with. So when we're talking about the kingdoms, that's what we're looking at. So he says, the kingdom of heaven, verse 31. Now I'm finally getting to this part is like a mustard seed. So what's this kingdom like? He says the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Like, that word like means it's similar, resembling, having the same or similar characteristics as a mustard seed. So what's the kingdom of heaven like? I'm going to give you today three things. He compares the kingdom of heaven with a mustard seed. So remember the kingdom of heaven is not heaven up there. It's a system or how heaven works, all right? Attitudes, values, concepts, goals, all of that. We'll just say system of heaven, the culture of heaven, how heaven works. He said it's like a seed. 
So if the system of heaven is like the seed, what is he saying? I'll give you three things today, and you're going to remember them. Number one, it sows. It's like a seed. It sows. Number two, it grows. Number three, it becomes. Kingdom of heaven is like a seed because it sows, it grows, and it becomes. Say it with me. It sows, it grows, and it becomes. One more time. It sows, it grows, and it becomes. Let's look at the first one. Kingdom of heaven is like a seed because, number one, it sows. There is a beginning. Something must be sown in order to produce in order to produce a desired end result. This is important for you to understand. We can come to church, but we need to understand this principle about the kingdom or the system of heaven for it to operate in our lives. What is Jesus trying to teach all of us? He's trying to teach us the system of the kingdom of heaven and how to get a desired end result. How do we get a desired end result in the kingdom? It's because, number one, we have to sow first. We have to give something now doing something now that you will not see the benefit of until later. The word sow literally means to place or scatter seeds in the ground for future growth. The kingdom of heaven is not a kingdom that operates based on need, but rather it's a kingdom that operates based on seed. Right? We got to get this principle. This is how the system of God works. So if we understand this, then we can put it into practical terms. Farmers, you can preach this better than me. We understand this with corn. Why do we not understand it with the kingdom of God? We understand it with tomatoes and peppers and whatever you put in your garden. You understand if you plant a tomato seed today, you don't dig it up three days later and put it on a sandwich. We understand that. Well, he's telling us in the kingdom of heaven that you do something now that you will harvest later. That's how our system works. So he's given us that principle. A need-based system is rampant in our society. What we're, what we're dealing with is an entitlement in our society where people think, because I need, therefore you must. You must do for me because I need. And so that, that system is rampant in our society, but the problem is that it's also rampant in the church. And the reason it's rampant in the church is because it's been taught. The theology that if you need it, God will give it to you. But if he doesn't think you need it, he won't give it to you. So you have no responsibilities whatsoever. It's totally up to him. He's completely 100% sovereign and controls every detail of your life. So now there's no responsibility for you. You just sit back and give whatever he takes or take whatever he gives. But that's not the kingdom of heaven. There must be a sowing. In order to produce what God wants to produce in our life, we have to be a part of that process. And it starts with sowing. Genesis 8 verse 22 says this, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Notice what it says. As long as the earth remains, there will be seed, time, and harvest. There will be a sowing, there will be a growing, and there will be a becoming. You want to see your life change? All right, it's going to involve this process. You're going to sow, you're going to grow, and then you're going to become. I just want to become. I know, me too. <laughs> I would love to go. <laughs> Show my age on that reference. Get, get some new material, Chad. That was I Dream a Genie. Anyway, see that on Get TV or something, but YouTube it. But we, we, we want instant results. We want things to happen like that. We want to snap our fingers and go. And it's not the way it works. We sow change, we grow, and then we become that. So beginning is about sowing a seed. Practical terms. What is, what is the seed? What is the seed that we sow? Luke chapter 8, verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. So if you need something in your life, you want, to, you want to become something in your life, you want to grow something in your life, it starts first with the seed. What do, we, what do we sow? I try to teach this all the time. We do not sow our wants. Prayer is not us telling God our wants so passionately that we finally convince him to do it. If you want to be effective in prayer, stop telling God how much you need it and thinking that's what's going to turn his hand loose. It's not about doing that. It's not about trying to convince him of the need. He knows what we have need of before we ask. 
So it's about the seed that we sow is his word. So I speak his word, and if I will speak his word and sow his word, his word will begin to grow, and his word will produce what I sow. When do we sow? John 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So now when we talk about the word, the word being the seed that we need, when do we sow it? John 1, in the beginning was the when was the word? In the, in the beginning. Now, we usually think about that's referring to Genesis chapter 1, about Jesus was in the beginning in the creation. Yes, he was. But as I was studying this, God brought this to my attention. He said, wait a minute. I want you to look at it from this perspective. That in the beginning was the word. In the beginning. So in the beginning of my problem should be the word. I should be sowing the word in the beginning, not after I've exhausted all my other options and stressed myself out. In the beginning, I start sowing the word. I was dealing with a problem this week and uh, praying about a decision, and I didn't know what to do, and I was racking my brain and thinking about going through all the pros and cons, because naturally, I'm an analytical thinker, and I like to figure things out and think about all these possibilities and, and get all the ripple effects, and I put it all together and try and figure out what to do, and I was trying to do that in this situation, and I wasn't getting anywhere but stressed out. Anybody ever been there but me? So I was there, and I, I, I was praying about it. What that meant was I was worrying and thinking about it. And I was telling God about my problem. And he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm praying about it. He said, you are. I said, yes, I'm, I'm praying about it. And, and I, when I say that, I don't want to be intimidating because I've had this happen, that people, well, I just don't hear God like that. These are thoughts that would come to my mind. Okay, so I don't want to be over dramatic with the story. Let me just go to the point. So God said, sow some seed. So I opened my Bible to Philippians chapter 4 because I was filled with all kinds of anxious thought. Philippians th chapter 4. And it says, be anxious. I'm having trouble getting there. I might as well just go ahead and quote it. Be anxious for nothing. Oops, too late. <laughs> Four words into the verse, I'd failed. Be anxious. I was sitting right here in our prayer time. Every morning, every morning, 7.30 to 9, it's open here in the auditorium. You can come and go and pray. And I was, and be anxious for nothing. I was anxious about everything. But in everything, in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So I did. I opened my Bible, and I read that out loud. And then I read it again. I read it again. I read it again. I read it again. I began speaking that out of my mouth. I'm sowing seed. Seed is the word. I needed peace to make a decision, and I did not have it, so I began to sow seed about peace. I began saying it. I still didn't have it. I didn't know what to do. But I turned off my pros, cons list. I turned off all of these arguments, and I just began to seek the peace of God through his word. And I began to go after him, and I began to say it, say it, say it. Long story short, in the next, over the next 24 hours, I began to sense something come on that I did not figure out any of the details. I didn't figure out what was going to happen. I didn't figure out all my lists. None of those questions were answered. But something came in my heart where I was like, I'm done. I know what to do. And I still didn't know any more details than what I knew before, but something grew inside of me, and I became what I sowed, which was peaceful. In the same condition of not knowing any more than what I knew before, I became something that I wanted because I sowed something that I needed. And it was the Word. So that's just practical ways on how to do it. So now, he sowed the seed in his field. It says in here, verse 31, which a man took and sowed in his field. Let me give you two applications for that. Application means where it works, where it works, where it's applicable. Um, like seed, for example, you don't take tomato seeds and sow them in your couch. Right? You, you don't take seeds and sow them in your dresser. You got to put them in the right place. Same thing with the word. You got to get it in your heart. So... That's one application, that Jesus was the seed that God sowed into the field or into the earth. He sowed Jesus. This world needed salvation. You needed salvation. I needed salvation. So the Father sowed Jesus a seed into the earth. One little bitty seed. Theologians say that among the time that Jesus was walking the earth, there were somewhere around 170 to 300 million people on the planet. 
and he sowed one person. That one person selected 12. 12 out of 300 million of them on the high side, 170 million on the low side. Those 12 people, the Bible says, turned the known world upside down. So what is he telling us? He's telling there's a power in the seed. So the general could be talking about the world. Specifically, number two, it's our lives. We sow the word into our own lives. I sow seed into my, my personal field, and I grow the principles of the kingdom of heaven in my life. We have to grow. That's why it's the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit has to be grown. You want more love in your life? Sow love, and you'll grow love. Fruit of the Spirit has to be grown, has to be developed. If we're going to be followers of Jesus, we have to understand there's a process of growing. So it's got to be grown. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says this, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And men. Hold, hold the phone. Jesus, the Son of God, had to increase? If Jesus, the Son of God, had to grow and increase in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man, how much more do we need to grow? Right? So that's just an example of how we need to grow through this. So 1 Peter 2, 2 tells us how to grow as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. We grow through the word. You need more patience in your life? Anybody? <laughs> we grow it. We grow it. We grow it by reading scriptures and speaking it over our life and stop saying, I'm just, I'm, I'm just so impatient. No, we start confessing the word over our life and we grow patience. We grow it through difficulty. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Going to be some adversity checking your growth, but keep growing. All right, that's the first one. It sows. I mean, time. I got to move forward. Number one, it sows. Number two, a seed, it grows. This means it's a process. But you notice he specifically said a mustard seed. A lot of S's in there. A mustard seed. So why a mustard seed? I got, I got an example of some mustard seeds right here. Mustard seed is a large herb with exceptionally small seed. During, in, the, in Palestine, with Jesus' time, it was known as the smallest known seed. Get it out, out there. I think I just got one. Yeah, okay, one seed. There you go, right there's a mustard seed. See it? <laughs> Look at that. Isn't it beauty? Smallest seed at that time, but this one mustard seed can grow to a plant over 10 feet tall. I'm only 6'8". This, this plant would be over 3 feet taller than me from that. The kingdom of heaven is like that. What is he saying to us? The system of heaven is like that? He's contrasting the size of the seed to the size of the plant? What's he saying? I believe he's telling us and encouraging us with this thought that the initial size of something does not determine the eventual impact. The initial size of something, how it starts out, does not determine the eventual impact. He's trying to tell us in the kingdom of God, if we will sow God's word into our life, the little changes, if I'll make a little change to line up with what God wants to do, that little insignificant change can grow and make a huge impact in my life. One decision to come to church, that one decision could change the entire his, or future of your entire family. One Sunday saying, okay, I'll go. That one Sunday you encounter Jesus in such a way that it changes your heart and now it changes the way you raise your kids. Now it changes the impact on your kids' lives. Now it changes on their kids' lives. All of that because of one decision not to sleep in but to come to church or one decision to turn it on and watch from home for the first time. One little seed could grow into a huge harvest. It's like a mustard seed, like a mustard seed. There's a lot of potential in there. Job, Job chapter 8 verse 7 says, though your beginning was small, yet your latter end would increase abundantly. Beginning is small. Here's what we need to know about the mustard seed. I can't even hardly hang on to it. Oops, I think I just broke him. <laughs> I was trying to be gentle. 
want to hug him and pet him and call him George. <laughs> He's a big fella. Just hold the seed. But it grows. Here's what I want to encourage you about the kingdom of heaven, what God tries to encourage me. Chad, uh, don't get discouraged because I ask you to grow. It's a process. It's a process. I'm still in process. I'm still working. I tell my kids, I'm on my fourth teenager, I'm still growing as a parent. I'm still learning. I'm trying to get better. I'm apologizing to my first all the time. It's like, hey, yeah, sorry about that. My bad. <laughs> Had to learn a few things. And she likes to remind me. But, it, you know, we should continue to grow. We should not be at our pinnacle at 26. We should be continue. I should not be the best husband on my wedding day. We should be growing. We should be getting better. And this is what God's saying in the kingdom of God. We've got to understand that the seed produces, it grows, it continues to develop. And it starts with small decisions, just like a mustard seed. Little bitty choice that I'm not going to say that anymore. I'm going to get up and I'm going to read my Bible. I'm just going to start doing a little devotion and read for 15 minutes. That little bitty mustard seed decision can eventually make a huge difference in who you are as a human being. But we get discouraged in the small process because we, we're like, it's just so little. I mean, it's no big deal. And we want big deals. We like big deals. God likes little decisions. He says in the Bible, he says to the one who had 10 minus, he says, well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over very little. So now you can be ruler over 10 cities. You know what God spoke to me out of that verse? He said, Chad, you want the 10 cities. I want the faithfulness. He said, you got your eyes on the wrong prize. We too many times think that the faithfulness in the very little is a means to the end. God says the faithfulness is the end. Come on, you got to grasp that. <laughs> we, we, we think, okay, I've got to be faithful of this little thing. And then I get the big thing I want. No, no, no. The faithfulness is what you want. You want the faithfulness because you want him. You're faithful to him. I don't, well, I'll do what God says. I'll put up with this because I know he's going to give me that big thing someday. No, faithfulness in the very little. He is the one that you're looking for. It grows. It grows. Let me move on. That's so good. Thank you, Jesus. So now, the kingdom principle components of the system of heaven is to sow something that is initially small but will produce a large eventual impact. Number three, what was number one? It sows. Number two, it grows. Number three, it becomes. It becomes the ending. So we've got the beginning, the process, and the ending. Look what it says in verse 32. Which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, process, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree. Started out the least of all the seeds, and now it's a tree. So that the birds of air can come and nest in its branches. The third one, it becomes. It becomes. It's an ending. So what it becomes a tree, what kind of tree does it become? What kind of tree it becomes is dependent on what kind of seed is sown. Whatever seed we sow is what it will become. We can't sow one thing and become something else. If I want to become something in result, then I have to think back to the beginning and begin to sow towards that and become what I sow. As I'm holding the, the mustard seeds here, see these things are a little bitty, but if I plant and you say mustard seeds, you use green beans, whatever's going to connect with you. If you sow something, it will become something. I can't expect something different when I keep sowing the wrong habits and the wrong ideas and the wrong goals. I can't be discouraged because I keep producing and keep becoming what I'm sowing. 
So it's saying the third thing is about it becomes a tree. It's just encouraging you and I. Here's how the system of heaven works. It will become whatever we sow. I've got to start from scratch. I've got to start, start in the beginning and say, listen, I want to produce something different in my life. I want to become a better person blank in this area. I want to become better at that. I want to have a better attitude. I want to do this. Whatever, whatever you're thinking about, I need to improve. Then we start with the seed. A lot of times we just want to become quickly. And God's saying, I want you to sow it, and then I want you to grow it, and you will become it. You will become it. You will become it. But you got to sow it. So look what it says here in Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit. How does, it, how does it yield fruit? Pay attention. And the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself. It becomes a tree. What kind of tree? Whatever kind of seed you're sowing, that's what it becomes. If I need to change something in the relationship in my marriage, I need to change some seed I'm sowing into my marriage. If I want to change some, the fruit that I'm eating in relationship with my kids, I need to change the seed that I'm sowing into them. If you want to change some things about your work, change things about your finances, change things about whatever area of your life, the seed that you're sowing is producing what you're eating right now. So I say, well, I want to eat something different. That's great. Start sowing something. Because what is sowing? We do something now for something we will harvest Later. Oh, that's like nails on a chalkboard to us. I want to sow something now that I can harvest this afternoon. I told her I loved her. Like everything should change. Because you had an epiphany and you said, well, I love you. Or whatever you're trying to get to. There's a sowing involved. You keep sowing. Because here's what I do sometimes. Maybe, maybe this doesn't... Uh, apply to you, but sometimes I'll sow the right thing, and I come right behind, and I sow the wrong thing. Like I'm feeling good, I've got it in the moment, and I'm sowing the right thing, okay, I'm really going to do better, I'm going to sow this, and then right behind it, I come back and sow the opposite of what I want, and I wonder why I got this cross-pollinated growth going on. That sometimes I'm good, sometimes I'm not, sometimes I'm feeling it, sometimes I'm not. What's going on? I'm producing what I'm sowing. So at some point, we got to stop sowing the garbage that we don't want to become. Just stop sowing. Is that easy? No. That'd be a no, 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 no. But that's the principle. We sow, we grow and then we become. Look what it says in Psalms chapter 1. I'm closing with this. Blessed is the man or woman who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. They're not sowing that seed. Nor stands in the paths of sinners. They're not listening to them. Nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his or her delight is in the law, the word, the seed of the Lord. And in his law, in his word, in his seed, he meditates how often? Day and night. It's amazing how we can worry day and night and have devotion for 15 minutes. If I stew, see, my problem was I was stewing and continuing to worry about the options of this decision. And I was continually letting those thoughts rehearse in my mind and I was not sowing any of this. So I was producing, I became what I was sowing, which was worried thoughts and anxiety. So I was becoming that. But when I stopped sowing that and started sowing this, it began to grow and then I began to become. But I had to stop sowing the wrong thing and start sowing the right thing. This is what God's wanting us to do. Verse 3, it says, And he or she shall be or become like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he or she does shall prosper. Mm. So the kingdom of heaven is like a seed. Like a seed. Great big seed.
Look at it. You know what that is? That's your future. That's your future life. It's right here. What do you want to do? What do you want to become? What do you want to grow into? It's right here. I don't look like much. You don't see 10 feet in there? There's 10 feet right there staring you in the eye. Said, I'm going to become, this seed is saying, <laughs> he's saying, trees are going to nest, in, the trees, sorry. Bird, thank you. Great analogy, Chad. Birds are going to nest in me. These others could be saying, you're dumb. You look like the rest of us. <laughs> I'm winging it right now. <laughs> this is unrehearsed, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're off script. So, this is what will happen. This seed believes there's something inside of it that's bigger than what everybody sees. This one gets in the right ground, gets in the right place, it can become something. But not everybody is going to celebrate your vision of changing your life. I'm going to become so big that birds can nest in me. Everybody around you going, yeah, right, that's funny. <laughs> but I'm telling you, that's the way you've got to believe. You can become something different, but it starts right here. It starts in a small, insignificant thing, seemingly, that you've got to change. Attitudes you're going to change, values you're going to change. Steps you're going to change. I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to stop hanging around those ideas. I'm going to stop training around, not because I'm better, but because I want to become something different. I just want to become something different. I don't want to be in this position for the rest of my life, so I'm going to start sowing so that I can harvest something different. And it all starts right here. You can become something different. You just got to keep sowing and growing. Somebody ask these questions. What kind of seeds are you sowing? What are you growing right now? What kind of habits, what kind of concepts, what kinds of beliefs, what kind of values are you growing? Because that's what you're becoming. We hope you enjoyed this message today and that you connected with Jesus. If this message has changed your life and you accepted Jesus as your savior, you can text the word new life to the number 618 243-0900. We would love to celebrate with you. If you would like to give to the ministry of The Roads Church, visit our website www.theroads.church for all of our giving options. We would also like to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive notifications of our Sunday live services and to discover more of Pastor Chad's teachings. And now we pray that you experience God's presence throughout your day.